Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 History Lecture Series. My name is Charity Urbanski, and I'm an Associate Teaching Professor in the Department of History at the University of Washington. I'll be serving as your host for this year's lecture series, and I'm delighted to have you join us this evening. As a reminder, tonight's lecture will be followed by a short question and answer period, and you can enter questions as you're watching the lecture. Before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that this event meets on the contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot nations and other Coast Salish peoples who call the waters and coastline of the Salish Sea home. The theme of this year's lecture series is capitalism, capitalism in action. Capitalism is something we're all familiar with to some degree, simply by virtue of the fact that we live in a capitalist society. However, it may be helpful to orient ourselves by reviewing exactly what we mean by capitalism before we launch into this lecture series. We commonly use the word capitalism to refer to an economic system that came of age in the 19th century, one that's dominated by free markets and within which trade and industry are privately owned and operated for profit. It seems straightforward enough, but this common usage disguises the fact that capitalism has been a hotly contested concept since the term was first introduced in the mid 19th century. It's an ism that historians love to hate. On the one hand, it's acquired so many meanings and definitions over the last century and a half that it's difficult to use with any precision. And on the other hand, we find that we can't just get rid of it. Economic historians tend to use capitalism in a very specific way as one of three levels of economic life. Those are the material life, the market economy and capitalism proper. Material life is a shadowy infra economy that lies underneath the level of the market economy. It's the informal other half of economic activity, the world of self-sufficiency and barter of goods and services within a very small radius. You can imagine it as a traditional village economy. It's historically the oldest and usually the slowest changing level of the economy. The market economy is the level that's most easily observable and therefore the most frequently written about. On this level, we find the mechanisms of production and exchange that are linked to rural activities, to small shops and workshops, to banks, exchanges, fairs, and of course, to markets. Finally, there's capitalism proper. Like the material life that exists below the level of the market economy, capitalism is a shadowy zone constructed on top of the market economy. It's a transnational world of foreign exchange and credit, a world of privileged actors who are engaged in calculations that ordinary people know nothing about. Most importantly for us, this capitalist system first emerged centuries before the term capitalism was coined or modern industrialized capitalism appeared. Crucially, this top level of capitalism is also disruptive. Capitalists create anomalies or zones of turbulence in order to reap extraordinary gains. Today, we would call this behavior disruptive innovation or moving fast and breaking things. For many economic historians, this is the only real capitalism. It is multinational, monopolistic, disruptive, and a close relation to the capitalism operated by the great Indies companies that flourished in, the, in early modern Europe. Within this system, historians examine conjunctures or what we would commonly call business cycles. These are the various fluctuations and swings that happen over the span of a few years or over the span of several centuries. Price history provides a basic starting point for this kind of analysis, but conjunctural analysis also allows us to explore things like population history, shifts of political regime, shifts of cultural styles, and all kinds of other fluctuating social movements. Our three speakers in this lecture series take different approaches to examining capitalism. Our first speaker tonight, Mark Metzler, explores capitalism through some of its crises or ruptures in the cycles of credit and debt, while Anand Yang and Leora Halperin will each use a specific commodity to explore regional histories of capitalism and engage broader questions of culture and politics. Finally, the series will be capped by a panel on global capitalism moderated by Jim Gregory. This evening's speaker is Professor Mark Metzler, who teaches in the fields of Japanese history and global economic history. He received his BA in International Studies at Stanford University and his PhD in History at the University of California, Berkeley. He has conducted research at Osaka City University's Faculty of Economics, the University of Tokyo's Institute of Social Science, and Kyoto University's Institute for Research and Humanities. We were delighted to welcome him to the University of Washington in 2017, where he currently holds a joint appointment in history and the Jackson School of International Studies. 
Throughout his career, Professor Metzler's scholarship has focused on economic history and financial crises. His first book, Lever of Empire, the International Gold Standard in the Crisis of Liberalism in Pre-War Japan, examines the origins of the Great Depression in Japan. The book also offers a new perspective on the global political dynamics of the era by placing Japan, rather than Europe, at the center of the story. The book's core question is, why did successive Japanese governments during the era of liberalism from 1920 to 1931 carry out policies that deliberately induced price deflation and economic depression, liberal policies that ultimately destroyed liberalism as a system? And how were these policy choices conditioned by the global politics of money? His detailed account illuminates not only the history of Japan, but also that of interwar Europe, the character of US isolationism, and the rise of fascism as an international phenomenon. Professor Metzler's second book, Capital is Will and Imagination, Schumpeter's Guide to the Post-War Japanese Miracle, investigates the nature of capital creation using Japan's experience after World War II as a case study. To understand what happened in post-war Japan, Professor Metzler turns to a neglected aspect of Joseph Schumpeter's theory of economic development, the nexus between money creation by banks, investment, and inflation. Economists and planners in post-war Japan found in Schumpeter's ideas a description of what they saw happening around them. They also put Schumpeter's ideas directly to work in developing a new style of high-speed industrial growth that, is, that since then spread across East Asia. As Professor Metzler also points out, however, the shadow of credit is debt, and the worldwide debt bubbles of recent times have revealed the limits of the 20th century growth model. His most recent book is Central Banks and Gold, How Tokyo, London, and New York Shaped the Modern World, which was co-authored with Simon Bythewey. This book explores how a financialized form of globalism featuring powerful central bankers and unprecedented credit bubbles took shape a century ago when Tokyo joined London and New York as a major financial center. Bythewey and Metzler tell the story of how the first age of central bank power and pride developed and how it ended in the disaster of the Great Depression, when a rush for gold brought the entire system crashing down. In all of this, we also see the quiet but surprisingly central place of Japan. Professor Metzler is currently working on a global history of international economic crises. Two pieces of the project he is writing this year concern the 1700s. One project is called Temporalities of Capitalism, the Transatlantic Slave Trade and the Birth of the Business Cycle. The second concerns the interactive emergence of capitalist trade cycle dynamics in maritime Asia and the age when most of that trade was still being carried out and managed by Chinese traders. His third current project entitled the 1970s Macro Cycle is about much more recent times and considers how the inner working of easy money, supply shocks, and inflation created an international ec economic situation that more and more commentators are comparing to our own present moment. His talk today draws upon insights developed in his previous work and examines capitalism through its crises. Professor, Professor Metzler will begin with Joseph Schrumpeter's insight that the history of business cycles is the history of the core process of capitalism. But in contrast to Schumpeter's view that bubbles and crashes are only epiphenomena, Professor Metzler argues that they are the most revealing of moments when self-reinforcing growth loops suddenly stop, structures of wealth and authority collapse, and trends reverse. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker in this year's lecture series, Professor Mark Metzler. Oh, thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me, I, I assume? Um, so it's great to be here. Um, thank you um, to Charity Urbanski for that really full introduction. And I really appreciated the way you set up capitalism um, via the ideas of the great um, 20th century French historian, Fernand Brodel, um, who's given us this three level model that really fits well with my own approach. Um, I'd also um, like to thank all of the organizers of this, especially Josh Apfel, who has really been taking the lead um, in a process that goes back months. Um, there's a whole lot of work that's gone into this, and um, it's um, very nice just to be able to step into um, such a, a well-running, um, well-organized machine. And welcome to the audience. Um, I wish I could see you all in person. Um, in a future year, we'll do that. Um, and maybe we can um, meet a little bit at the question of answer. 
question and answer session at the end. Um, I'll start um, with four observations um, to set up my talk here to help frame the discussion. And then I'll talk about a few specific individual historical crises. First observation, the greatest of the economic crises of the kind that I'll be talking about, um, for example, the crisis of 1929 or the crisis of, 19, of 1873 have a historical impact comparable to that of great wars. They're among the most significant events in history. A second observation is that we ourselves are living through an age of monumental debt crises. We need to understand them much better than we do. A third observation is that debt crises are the downside of the credit creation process. And I like to describe this as uh, the difference between enabling credit and binding debt. Um, credit and debt are of course two names for the same social transaction, um, but the word we use very much affects what we see here in thinking about those two sides of the process. And a final observation is that most of what we call money actually consists of credit, um, consists of bank balances, um, meaning of course simultaneously debt. Um, this is true in a modern capitalist economy, um, but I think in pre-modern times to a greater level than is appreciated various forms of credit um, form part of the money supply. Um, I'd like to set things up um, by stepping back and thinking about um, the very earliest financial crises, um, thinking about this thing called capitalism um, from the standpoint of at least some of its origins here. And when I'm thinking about capitalism, I'm focusing especially on the capital in capitalism, um, that is this credit debt nexus here. So how far back in time can we find capitalist style crises and why might that be revealing? It's useful to look back at the earliest well-documented cases of capitalist type financial crises and then to scan the centuries since. Um, why study the very earliest crises? There's a long-standing idea that capitalism is something modern. Um, the implication being that there's not so much to be learned from the past. Um, in fact, even if we look at the past couple of centuries, um, there have been dozens of significant international financial crises, about nine or 10 per century in the last couple of hundred years, including some really big ones. And we can find a similar type of crisis um, much, much further back in time. Um, it can clarify things to study events in very different times and places um, from our own. It's a way of investigating the dynamics of capitalism in general. So for some stage setting, um, I find Janet Abu Lugod's book, Before European Hegemony, very useful for describing the Eurasian context within which capitalism in, developed in Western Europe. And I'll be commenting especially on the two opposite ends of this picture of interconnected trading spheres that she's got um, depicted here, um, each of which would involve one year's journey. Um, few individual merchants traversed from one sphere to another sphere. Most people operated within a sphere and then there were interfaces between these spheres. Um, goods did traverse from sphere to sphere to sphere. And critically, so did money. And here's a second very useful starting point, um, Akinobu Kuroda's 2009 article about the Eurasian silver century, um, appearing in the Journal of Global History, explores the monetary aspects of this same era. Um, in particular, he looks at how vast stores of silver in China, um, this is zone eight in Abu Lugad's map here, were pumped through zone three, Central Asia, and onward to places further west. Um, later on, this movement reversed. Um, that was the era of the great bullion famine of the 1400s. So how might things look if we start the macro story with China? Um, 
The invention in China of a package of Renaissance innovations is well known, paper and printing, gunpowder weapons, magnetic compass, um, new techniques of shipbuilding and so on. Less well known is a series of monetary big bangs emanating from China in the Song and Yang dynasties. Um, by the year 1000, um, early in the Song period, Song mints were producing more than 1 billion copper coins a year, um, unprecedented mint volumes, and both copper coins and silver are flowing out from China to other countries. Another monetary big bang involves the invention of paper money, um, which the Southern Song Dynasty comes to rely on from the 1160s. Um, also um, circulating internally in China, um, silver, um, copper are flowing out. And yet another big bang, um, the Mongols Yen Dynasty institutes its own paper money, a means of extracting silver from the Chinese populace. Um, they capture and loot the monast monetary stores in Hangzhou. Um, and for the next 50 years or so, systematically extract silver from China and recirculate it in Central Asia. This is Kuroda's silver century, this period. And if we jump right across the Eurasian continent to the other furthest corner, um, to England, we see signs of this. Um, currency estimates support this view. Um, we see, as you can see here, a great wave of silver flowing into Europe and into the furthest corner, England, and then flowing out again. And it's also as we get into this period of monetization um, that we really see the first truly detailed account of international capitalistic type financial crises. Um, this is the first um, crisis that we really have a close description of. Um, is it the very first crisis, as Del Punta suggests? Um, at least it's the first one that I've found any records of in the literature. Um, there may be others that um, we simply don't have records of. And it was a distinctly international crisis um, with the collapse of the Richarded Company of Luca, um, bankers to the King of England. Already we see here a number of classic elements of financial crisis. Um, one thing to know about this period, um, reconnecting to that big word, capitalism, um, if capitalism could be said to exist 700 years ago, it was at most a system of networks and enclaves. Outside of a few urban micro environments within which capitalists were gaining social and political primacy, capitalists were useful but vulnerable servants to lavish but dangerous territorial lords. In relationship to these powerful lordly patrons, they were outsiders to the system of political power. And we could say even in places where merchant bankers did gain real political power, such as Florence, many of them when they op had the opportunity, ultimately transformed themselves into lords of landed estates. Despite these limitations, um, we see these, cap these classic elements of capitalist crises appearing already. And I've listed a few here. A boom fueled by lending connected to international trade and credit networks. In particular, we see lending to sovereigns, and this is linked to concessions given by sovereigns to merchants, to future revenue streams um, that those merchants are managing. Um, in this case, the wool export trade of England. Um, can we call this a situation of globalization? Um, for instance, in 1285, when King Edward I suspended the self-governing liberties of the city of London and opened London trade to alien merchants, mostly Italian, who had been excluded from trade there. These foreign merchants, as London merchants had feared, quickly dominated large-scale local money lending. Um, this was the upside of what was evidently a commodity price cycle tied to a money and credit cycle, an inflationary boom followed by deflationary contraction and debt crisis. Um, imports of silver come to a peak in the late 1280s. 
um, so do, and detailed records remain of this, um, so does lending by foreign merchants come to a peak. And in the subsequent debt crisis, um, depression of the early 1290s, we see a kind of anti-capitalist backlash and social scapegoating that will very much remind us of later crises. In 1290, Edward I ordered the expulsion of the Jews from England, something that was to last for centuries. He seized their debt claims for himself, something our colleague Robert Stacy has worked on um, this particular history. In 1291, Edward cracked down on counterfeiters and targeted foreign merchants for prosecution. In the same year, 1291 in France, King Philip IV ordered the arrest of all Italian merchants there in order to extort money from them. Um, this was an international crisis in multiple dimensions. And the culmination came in 1294 with the de facto default of the English king, the bankruptcy of the Ricciardi house um, and King Edward seized their assets at this time. Um, the crisis of the 1290s was also a preplay for an even greater crisis 50 years later in the mid 1340s which featured this same combination of Italian lending to the English king, a default by the English king, um, major, much bigger bankruptcies this time, and this time in Florence. Um, notably, this was just a few years before the Great Plague hit um, in 1348, um, hit Europe and hit the Middle East. Um, thus, we see a financial bubble, a financial crisis, forming part of the general crisis, crisis of these years, um, which was also a crisis with great ecological and demographic dimensions. Um, for some theoretical um, stage setting, um, I'll turn to the views of Joseph Schumpeter. Major international business cycles of roughly nine or 10 years in length were widely noticed as apparent, an apparently novel aspect of the new industrial capitalism of the 19th century, not the kind of mercantile capitalism that I've been talking about. There was a panic of 1825 um, that featured um, widespread national debt defaults um, by a new cohort of newly independent South American republics. Um, the lending was coming out of London. Um, there was the panic of 1837, um, an international panic affecting both the United States, Britain, and other places. The panic of 1847, the panic of 1857, the panic of 1866, the panic of 1873, um, that I'll say more about in a moment, and so on. Um, Schumpeter's thesis concerning capitalist development helped sharpen the focus here. Um, the essential process as he argued, was the creation of new credit capital for new enterprises, which in itself explains cyclic ups and downs. In principle, new credit creation is inflationary. Um, banks create new purchasing power and provide it to entrepreneurs who organize new enterprises. enterprises. In principle, the results of these new enterprises ought to be deflationary, forcing prices down, at least on the supply side, because they will provide more production, better production, and more efficient production. Hence, we have business cycles, and these are not side effects of the capitalist process. They're the mechanism through which the capitalist development process operates. Um, I've been um, pursuing this in relationship, um, applying this schema in relationship to the 1700s, um, thinking um, that we can see in these kinds of movements, if we can find them, a kind of rhythmic um, time signature of capitalist dynamics at work. I'm looking especially at maritime Eastern Asia just before the era of European predominance and looking at the transatlantic slave trade and asking the question, are these sectors, were these sectors in some way hyper-capitalistic in their functioning? 
It certainly raises some big questions if we find this kind of dynamic operating in overseas Chinese trade in the era when it was still larger than European trade in the Eastern Eurasian region. And to say the least, Schumpeter's evaluation of the capitalist entrepreneur as the, capital, as the positive agent of progress obviously hinges on the type of enterprise we are considering. What does it mean, for example, to say that business was innovative or booming or that business was depressed when it comes to the business of the slave trade? I'll spend more time talking about um, something that I've been working on for much longer, and that's the crises of the late 19th century, um, in particular focusing on the crisis of 1873 and its aftermath. By the mid 19th century, the world's first truly global credit system had come into existence, centered on the city of London. With that came truly globalized credit cycles. Um, in the 1850s and 1860s, a phase of high commodity prices, above all for wheat and cotton, encouraged an international extension of export agriculture, of steamship lines and railways. All of this funded by a great extension of international banking and credit. Um, this was the greatest trade boom in history up to this point. And the international boom went into overdrive with the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. The US Transcontinental Railway was completed in the same year. Then in May 1873, we have the great crash of speculative stock markets and real estate markets in Vienna. Um, it was called, or at least called in retrospect, the Gründerkrach, um, the crash um, of the, the founders or the enterprisers, um, because new business enterprises had been so prominent during the overheated boom period of the few years preceding this. Germany was immediately caught up in crisis. Then in September of the year 1873 came the great crash in New York City, um, one of the greatest in US history, comparable to the crash of 1929, um, the much more famous crash of 1929. Immediately, prices began to fall. Um, and here you can see some data from the time um, showing um, those price decreases. Um, Robert Giffen, the British government's top economic statistician, addressed a question that echoes into more recent times, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time with this question. Why is the depression of trade so much greater in the raw material producing countries? As Giffen explained, the international depression arose out of the interaction of the world's industrial core and its commodity producing periphery. Um, I've used those words, not Giffen, but that's very much of the essence of what he's talking about. Um, thus in 1877, Giffen wrote, the conspicuous industry which has failed is that of the exploitation of new countries with little surplus capital and whose business is mainly that of producing raw materials and food for export by old countries with a large surplus capital that are largely engaged in manufacturing, Britain, of course, um, being the foremost of these. And he explains the order of operations, as we could call it, in this international depression. The difficulties commenced in the countries more or less farmed by the capital of England and other old countries whose industries are nourished by loans from England. And he went through this sequence of events. The May 1873 crisis in Austria-Hungary, he said, answered this description to some extent. Um, the capital coming into Austria-Hungary um, came more out of Paris and more out of Berlin um, than out of London in this case, um, but the dynamic was similar. And Giffen said, the description is still more applicable to the United States where the next great crash occurred. As for the South American countries, and I'm quoting him, whose prolonged suffering was the special feature of 1874, 
They are almost a domain of England. Russia likewise, he said, is largely developed by English capital. Um, so viewing the world from London, the United States and the countries of South America are all, Giffen wrote, in much the same stage of development. New countries whose industry is mainly agricultural or mineral. Thus, as commodity prices fell, it threw commodity exporting regions into crisis and triggered a wave of international debt defaults. And here's a list of defaults. Um, already in 1872, at the final peak of the international boom, there were signs of over indebtedness with the defaults of Santo Domingo and of the US states, South Carolina and Virginia. Then in 1873 came the defaults of Honduras, Colombia, also the US states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, and West Virginia. In 1874, the defaults of Costa Rica, Paraguay, Liberia, Louisiana. In 1875, Bolivia, Guatemala, Tennessee, and the really big one, the Ottoman Empire. This was the biggest of all, defaulting on debts of about 250 million British pounds, or in the money of that time, about 1 billion US dollars. Um, if we were to get a rough idea of what that means in modern times, um, you would multiply, multiply that by 100 or more. In 1876, ending this wave, more big defaults of Peru, of Egypt, also Uruguay. And it's Egypt that presents the really paradigmatic case, as I'll mention in a moment. Giffen also suggested that the international debt crisis would be remembered as the outstanding feature of the economic crisis of the 1870s. Um, however, in most later and US-centered analyses, this great fact has actually been forgotten. Um, one special intensifying factor entered the picture in 1877 as climate crisis coincided with debt crisis, um, making the depression of the 1870s um, because of this combination of factors um, different from and in some ways worse than the 1930s, um, which did have its um, own climate shocks, but not nearly to the extent that the 1870s did. Um, an especially strong El Nino episode started at the end of 1876 and reached its greatest intensity in 1877 and 1878. Um, North China, um, a zone outside of the typical drought area um, caused by El Ninos, but sometimes affected, was in this case the region worst hit. Um, contra um, Mike Davis's um, very provocative interpretation, um, the connections of the North China famine to the world economic crisis were actually not so strong or direct as research by my colleague Ho Wen Kai has shown. In Western and Southern India, however, um, the famine was also especially severe, um, killing an estimated 5 million people. And here Davis's interpretation, um, we could call it a kind of maladies of capitalist imperialism model, seemed spot on. Um, the famine came in a time when the region was already suffering from the collapse of the cotton boom of the mid-century years, um, from rising debt levels and debt riots. This was also the time when India first began systematically to make large grain exports to England, um, precisely at the time that Indians could least afford to be making those kinds of exports. Um, as for other effects of the crisis, uh, the crisis of the 1870s um, and follow on crisis of the 1880s, I'll conclude by mentioning just three out of a very long list. One is a generalized anti-capitalist reaction, including social scapegoating in a familiar anti-Jewish form, but now animating a new kind of modern mass politics. Um, here you see some cartoons of 1881, 1880 and 1881, criticizing the anti-Semitic agitation led in Germany by the court preacher, Adolf, um, a kind of 
odd resonance with that name, um, Stücker. Um, Anti-Semitic political movements thus had a first wave of popularity in Germany and in Austria as well from the late 1870s into the mid 1890s and then faded away um, as an active political movement for a time. We can also consider the new imperialism of those years. Um, as mentioned, Egypt presents a kind of paradigmatic case, in this case, linking debt crisis and imperialism. After defaulting on its bonds, Egypt was put under a joint Anglo-French fiscal control, which began to reduce the country to a kind of quasi-colonial status. That helped provoke a nationalist coup by Egyptian army officers, and that in turn became a pretext for the 1882 British invasion and de facto colonization of the country that you see depicted here. The British invasion in turn was a great trigger for the imperialist scramble of the 1880s, a sudden wave of European invasions of Africa and Southeast Asia. I would not say that the depression caused the new imperialism. The other invasions were not about debt. Um, on the other hand, the search for protected markets at a time of perceived overproduction served as a major supposedly rational justification for colonialism at the time. And a third consequence can be seen in the course that the new imperialism itself took. And here um, I'll present a kind of case study of West Africa um, where this process happened in an especially clear way. In West Africa's relatively free trade order of the mid 19th century, during the mid 19th century boom years, British trade was predominant without Britain controlling any large colonial areas. Um, this was a phase of export boom, especially in palm oil um, in the 1850s particularly. Then in the mid 1880s, depression plus intensifying rivalry between the European imperialist powers led to the establishment of exclusively controlled trading territories by new parastatal trading companies. These companies, above all, the British Royal Niger Company, complained of excess competition. Their solution was cartelization, amalgamation, cutting out African middlemen, and vertically integrating their operations. Thus, for West Africa, the typical Depression era process of oligopoly formation, something we see in industry after industry during these same decades, was simultaneously a process of imperial expansion. Political units forcibly aggregated into much larger territories administered by European companies and state agencies. In this case, the modern state of Nigeria originated literally as a company state in this new age of neo-mercantilism, much in the same way that India had originated as a company state um, organized by the English East India Company in the first mercantilist age. To give then a general conclusion um, to this discussion of late 19th century depressions, of the depressions of the, the long era from 1873 to 1896, um, this long era of sliding prices, um, the reaction against liberalism gives a unified picture to the era. And we can see that in dimension after dimension, um, whether in the social political dimension, as I've mentioned, um, whether in the dimension of business organization. And this is true even in England itself, which was a kind of bastion of classical liberalism, um, or at least is thought of in that way. New oligopolistic structures emerged. They were often connected to state authority. Um, an example is given by China, um, where there's a shift from a relatively freer trade, um, more unregulated treaty port capitalism um, 
to one involving much more um, state regulation, um, with the pivot here being the crisis of 18, 1884, um, same year as the crisis um, really hits West Africa, um, with the crash of tea markets, um, which Professor Anand Young will be talking about um, in the next talk, and tea in general, I mean, and silk markets there in that year. Um, or um, companies, these new oligopoly companies, as I've mentioned, constituted virtual state structures themselves, um, such as the case of the parastatal trading companies. Thus the corporate revolution of the 1880s and 1890s, this period of amalgamation, um, indeed the birth of the modern corporation um, as analyzed by the most, history, most famous historian of the subject, Alfred D. Chandler. Um, this picture belongs in a common analytical frame with the corporate invasion of wide regions of Africa and Southeast Asia at the same time, and the setting up of, of numerous parastatal trading companies um, delegated with the task of doing this. Um, now to conclude, um, and a first conclusion will be to make comparison to um, the much um, better known depression of the 1930s. From the 1910s to the 1930s, there's another great wave of international lending um, in the 1910s and 1920s and another international debt crisis in the 1930s. And I'll turn, um, because of the way it illuminates the present, um, to a view from the banker Paul Warburg, um, one of the framers of the Federal Reserve System, um, which went into operation in 1913, 1914, just at the, the beginning of the graph of crisis that you see here. Um, Warburg writing, um, having given a speech in Wall Street and then publishing it some seven months before the crash of the New York stock market um, had major forebodings. In fact, warning about the results of his own creation. Um, and quoting here, um, from the economic lessons taught by the aftermath of the great war, we learned that the excessive creation of money or bank credit without an equivalent production of real productive assets spelled in, spells inflation. Um, again, um, we can think about Schumpeter's picture, um, but without the link, linkage to entrepreneurship um, with financial investment, chasing financial investment, um, particularly in the stock market and in real estate, um, echoes of the present. And this banking structure, um, Warburg continued, that carried this inflated inverted pyramid rested on a basis of Federal Reserve credit, which itself had been inflated. Um, that should sound very familiar to us early 21st century people, um, just increase everything by a few orders of magnitude. Um, the depression of the 1930s also has dozens of close parallels to, to the depression of the 1870s. Um, you, there's a whole lot to say about those parallels and I'll just note two points. Um, the first is that this was a new international debt crisis. As you can see in this 170 year statistical view, um, I'm drawing here um, on the, the data put together by Christian Zutter. Um, the international debt crisis of the 1930s had a similar profile and indeed a similar geography to that of the 1870s, but it was much more extensive than that earlier crisis. If we look ahead in time, it was also a preplay of the so-called third world debt crisis that broke out in 1982 um, and extended through the 1980s and 1990s and affected almost every country in Latin America, Africa, in Eastern Europe. This international debt crisis aspect of the 1930s depression usually gets forgotten in most histories of the period. The second point, which we do remember, concerns the dire political effects of the crisis, which were most dire in Germany. Um, 
Here you can see images from the depth of depression election of 1932. Um, note in the middle picture here, um, the possibly hapless looking bourgeois center party campaigner in the middle, um, Nazis on his right, um, the socialists and the communists on his left. Um, he had the hard sales job of promoting the current governor of Chancellor Heinrich Brüning, um, known as Germany's hunger chancellor, um, who was at the time putting the German economy um, through a kind of deflationary ringer um, in the middle of an international deflation. Um, parallels also to what was happening at just the same time in Japan. And this is the subject of my own book, Lever of Empire. Um, in Japan also, the crisis of 1930 to 1932 triggered in turn um, the rise of fascist movements, of Japanese style fascist movements, um, and a turn from a relatively much more democratic functioning um, to much more um, relatively anti-democratic, um, fascistic and militarist kind of functioning. And I'll conclude by um, making some connections to the present um, and, and to another project that um, I'm finishing up this year. Um, I mentioned already the international debt crisis of the 1980s. Um, and this project involves um, sketching out the credit boom debt bust micro macro cycle from the early 1970s to the onset of the international debt crisis in 1982. Um, here I'll simply note some parallels to the present. Um, for the past couple of years, countless um, more and more economic commentators have foreseen a return to a 1970s type combination of easy money, supply shocks, and stagflation. Um, here, historians should emphasize that we have in fact been seeing the lowest interest rates and the easiest money in the entire historical record. That's saying something. Um, and of course, if we say easy money, that means we're looking at things from the credit side. Um, we could also um, talk about debt and say that we're looking at the biggest debt buildup in the historical record. Most reminiscent of the 1970s, supply shocks have recently reverberated across the global economy, um, including particularly big energy supply and price shocks. Um, driven from the monetary or demand side, um, driven now also from the supply side, inflation, inflation of goods and services in general um, has surged to levels internationally um, that haven't been seen in decades. Um, in fact, not since the end of the 1970s. Um, stagnation has not arrived and maybe it won't. Um, in whichever case, I'd say that we've entered a new era of economic history. And with that, I'd like to, um, to return to Professor Charity Urbanski, um, who will host us for Q and A. Um, Thank you so much for that wonderful lecture, Professor Metzler. Um, we do have several questions. Uh, I think I'm going to start with what should be a fairly straightforward one. Um, do you have a book that you would recommend about the history of international debt crises for anyone who's interested in learning more about these? Um, there's a lot, I, I don't know. What I would recommend, I'm, I'm actually trying to write my own. I don't know um, what, I would, um, what I would recommend um, off the top, actually. Um, I'll have to put some Look thought Look forward in. to your forthcoming book. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's going to take some time. I'll have to put some thought into that. And maybe um, one thing I didn't do for this talk was, was put together some kind of reading list. And, and maybe it would make sense to, um, to put that together and post it. Yeah, I'm sure our viewers would appreciate that. Um, okay, well, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, one of our viewers would like to know, to what extent uh, was the outcome of the Civil War and the collapse of the cotton plantation economy a contributor to the debt crisis of the 1870s? Um, it was very directly connected. That's a great question. Um, 
because the um, the international cotton boom, um, as it was in the rest of the world um, in the 1860s, um, consequent on the northern embargo of southern ports, um, the slave production in the southern states um, being what fed the English cotton mills here, and famously the the conjoint system of enslavement in the United States and um, the sort of world's most dynamic textile industry in Northeastern England. Um, this is thrown into crisis by the US Civil War. Um, that's when Egypt booms. Um, Egypt becomes a major cotton exporter. Um, that's also when the Suez Canal project is going on um, and the English government, take, the Egyptian government takes on enormous debt in the context of this cotton boom, engages in all kinds of developmental projects. Um, India was already under British colonial rule, but Western India, um, centered on the port of Bombay, um, also becomes a major cotton exporting zone. Um, and it's not just those countries. Um, everybody that can grow cotton is growing cotton during these years. Um, so cotton more than any other commodity um, traces out an extreme boom bust cycle. In that case, um, there's a first crash already in late in this beginning in the spring of 1865 and in 1866 that conditions that particular crisis. Um, but cotton prices will continue down and down and down um, all the way from then into the 1890s. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm scanning the, the questions here. Uh, so here's another one that sort of, it seems like it's right in your wheelhouse. Um, leaders in uh, Miji, Japan were taking their first steps toward an industrial policy in the 1870s, just as a major financial crisis was taking hold. Military goals were usually cited as the main objectives of Miji Japanese policy, but it seems possible that leaders were reading Giffen about the plight of countries that focus on commodities exports. Could you comment a bit more on how 1870s panics may, affect, may have affected Japanese economic growth policies? That's really interesting also. I don't know if they were reading Giffen or not. Certainly um, some of them must have been um, at this time. Um, the basically, um, I mentioned China already in Japan. Um, this gets to be a long story, but China and Japan were both on silver standard currencies at this time. And the deflation that I showed was mainly a phenomenon of countries that were on the gold standard, um, which after 1873 included in a de facto way the United States and France um, and other um, industrialized countries in Europe. So Japan, to a significant extent, actually escaped these depressions. The only really serious depression of the era in Japan was in the early 1880s. Um, Japan was also lucky because its main export good was silk. And actually, there was a silkworm disease that wiped out silk production in Europe, in Europe and Anatolia. Um, and really boosted Japanese exports, um, especially in the late 1870s. Um, so um, Japan did pretty well during this period. Um, one thing that Japanese leaders did especially notice was the invasion of Egypt. Um, and this lesson was applied in two ways. Um, the first lesson was um, don't take out foreign loans um, because that can be used as a lever for political domination. Um, and the other lesson was foreign loans can be a tool of political domination. And I've quoted in my book, Japanese leaders discussing the mechanics of colonizing Korea, of gaining influence in Korea before it was under Japanese control by using government backed loans saying, um, we can use loans in the same way that the British used loans to take control of Egypt. Um, in this case, thinking about Korea and even prospectively later on thinking about China. Um, so um, that that's something they were definitely paying attention to. Okay. Um, actually, here's another, we've actually got a lot of questions. Uh, you used the term hypercapitalism when you were talking about the, I believe the mid-Atlantic slave trade. Uh, could you give a quick explanation of that term for us? 
that, that's a project that I'm just starting on. So I don't, I, I have hypotheses rather than conclusions. I've, I've got to produce a, a book chapter in the next few months. So um, I'm, I'm about to get very active with it. Um, I've noticed a couple of things. Um, there was a period during which a kind of mercantilist company was set up um, by the British to try to control the slave trade. That didn't last very long. And it seems to have been characterized by a hyper-competitive situation with lots and lots of small, and in this case, regional operators um, coming out of Bristol, coming out of Liverpool. Um, so a lot of local credit creation, a lot of competition, a lot of small scale operations, and the system ran on credit and debt from beginning to end. Um, the colonial economies, um, in the Chesapeake Bay and the Caribbean um, ran on very high debt levels. Um, in that way, it seems hyper-capitalistic. Um, and I think there's other aspects of it also, but in the particular cyclicity of it, um, that's what I'm especially focusing on as, as a new tool for, for getting at these dynamics. Um, I think we'll see it there also. Um, so that was one particular thought. Um, maybe one more thing to say about that. A lot of people would define capitalism from the labor side and think about particular labor regimes as capitalistic or not as cap or as non-capitalistic. Um, to me, it seems that capitalism, actually in the sense that you discussed in your in your introduction, um, is a system that takes advantage of every and all existing kinds of labor regimes um, that extracts wealth from a whole variety of setups. Um, and here you see, I think, perfect illustration of it. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, could you discuss how money supply is a contributing factor towards debt crisis, whether that money supply is created politically through the printing of fiat, cur fiat currency or the increase through new physical sources like those of silver from Nevada mines in the late 1800s? Um, yeah, it's all of those things. It's I, I would visualize it as um, you have a, a kind of in this period in the especially thinking about the period before the 20th century when we we start to move completely away from from monies that are based on metal. Um, but if we're thinking about the 19th century, um, a silver or a gold monetary base, but upon that are built layers of credit um, and increasing layers of leverage. Um, the characteristic feature of the classic gold standard um, as invented in Britain was that it was actually a system of gold and paper money. Um, it was never just a system of gold. Um, it was a, a system run by the Bank of England in which gold formed the foundation, but then Bank of England notes were issued on the basis of that they in turn could serve as bank reserves and credit could be leveraged many fold. So the gold standard itself was a multi-leverage system. So if we increase the monetary base, if there's more mining um, that sort of gets multiplied very, very quickly. Um, in the case of the California gold rush, I don't know if anyone remembers um, the graph that I showed, but one can see British prices and in fact, world prices just jumping upward suddenly after a period of depression in the 1840s, jumping upward um, in a couple of years in a tremendous way and setting off a boom. Um, so that's money supply plus credit dynamics. Right. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you say something about how you see the relationship between war and debt crisis? Uh, this viewers, particularly thinking about the default of Southern states in 1873 and then the aftermath of World War I, as mentioned by Warburg. Um, these are both great examples of how intimately war is tied to it. Um, in each of these cases, um, you do sometimes see great debt crises in the absence of wars, uh, but more typically than not, um, they're associated with wars. Um, wars even in the time of King Edward I, um, wars are funded by borrowing and debt. I mean, that's uh, really an original nexus of capitalism. Brodel, um, Fernand Brodel certainly emphasizes that. 
Um, wars are inflationary. Wars are funded by debt. Um, and after that, um, we get some kind of debt overhang. Very typically, we get debt crisis and debt defaults. Um, so the US Civil War is a perfect example. Um, World War I is an immense example. Um, and if we want to think about the Great Depression, um, we can't think about the Great Depression without thinking about the Great War that came before it. Um, there are absolutely two sides of a single process. Right, right. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much uh, again for your lecture this evening. Um, and I think that's going to end our question and answer session. Uh, please join us for our next two lectures in the series and then for our final um, round table or panel on global capitalism that we'll be topping the series off with. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Yeah, bye-bye.